The Lions of Little Rock, Chapters 5 and 6. Chapter 5, James Thomas. On the second day of school, James Thomas Dalton ran in late. JT, which is what everyone called him, was tall and blonde and played football too. He had blue eyes and a dimp on his chin and his nose was just slightly off center. I thought it made him look even more handsome. Like half the girls in my class, I had a crush on him. Not that anyone knew. I hadn't even told Judy. It was embarrassing to like someone who still didn't know his times tables. But JT had flair. He had confidence. That and really long eyelashes. My brother's car had a flat, JT announced to everyone and no one in particular. I had to help change it. Miss Taylor nodded in sympathy. I'll excuse you this time. JT grinned at her and his smile blinded us all at the fact that there was not a bit of grease or dirt on his clothes. The only open seat was next to me, so he strode over and threw his bag down. Hi, Marley, he said. Of course he knew my name. We'd been in school together since we were six, but it still gave me a thrill. I smiled back and tried to move my bag out the way, but I bumped it instead. Four or five new pencils rolled out across the floor. Sally giggled as I gathered them up. JT handed me one of the pencils, and our fingers touched, and I could almost hear the wedding bells. Even though we were in homeroom, Miss Taylor couldn't help giving us a preview of what we were going to do in history that afternoon. She started going on and on about Arkansas and how we'd each pick a topic and give a presentation to the class. Pretty soon I stopped listening. Sally would ask me to be her partner and I'd do all the work. That's how it always was. Besides, I was having too much fun imagining my life with JT. By lunchtime, I planned our honeymoon in Italy and was trying to decide if we should name our first son Orbit or Cosine, which someone slid into their chair beside me. I just about spit out my peanut butter and jelly sandwich when I realized it was JT. Hi, Marley, he said. I knew I should squeeze out a hi or maybe a hello or maybe even a hello, JT. But of course, he knew what his name was and my mouth was full of peanut butter. Still, I'd promised Judy I'd try to speak. So before I could tuck myself out of it, I said, hi, JT. I was pleased. I sounded so smooth and calm, at least until I reached for my milk to wash down the peanut butter and knock the, over the carton instead. JT, always a gentleman, mopped up the mess. I was wondering if you'd be willing to help me with math this year, he said as he pushed a pile of soggy napkins around the table. I was too surprised to move. There was still a big blob of peanut butter stuck in the roof of my mouth. If I said something, JT would be really grossed out. Mr. Harding's a hard teacher, JT went on. I'm sure to fail if I don't find a tutor, and I don't want to have to repeat the seventh grade like my brother did. I'm not so good at math, and you're great at it, so what do you say? Do you want to help me? I swallowed. This is my chance. I do. He grinned, put out his math book, and handed it to me. The first assignment's on page 12, numbers 1 through 21. I knew that. We were in the same class. Still, I didn't mind being the brains in the family. Let's meet up before school tomorrow, and you can explain it to me, he, suge he suggested. Say, at the picnic table by the football field? I nodded. He patted me on the shoulder. Thanks, Marley, he said. You're a real sweet girl. Then he walked off to join his friends at the regular table. I was on cloud nine. I had a date, a real date with JT. We'd had a whole conversation. He liked me. He, he just wants you to do the work for him, Sally said, sitting down at the table. I shrugged. I was happy, and I wasn't going to let Sally take that away from me. Maybe, said Liz as she put down her tray. But he sure is cute. I didn't hear the rest of the conversation after that. I was too busy thinking about Cosine and his little sister, Isosceles. The next morning, I had Daddy drop me off at school extra early. I had pencils, paper, both our math books, and my homework. JT you could use it as an answer key if he got stuck. He wasn't at school when I arrived, so I sat down at the top of the picnic table. I waited a long time. Cosine and Isosceles were in college by the time JT's brother, Red, finally pulled up to the curb. 
JT might be a cup of hot chocolate with whipped cream and sprinkles on top, but his brother was castor oil. Red was 17, a year older than Judy. He had blonde hair and blue eyes like his little brother. And his features were so regular, they looked like they had been laid out with a ruler. If you ask me, it's people's imperfections that give them character. A nose slightly off center or a dimple or one ear slightly higher than another. There was something creepy about Red's perfectly symmetrical face. Or maybe it wasn't about his face at all. Once when we were all little kids playing in an old quarry near our house, Red had called me over to see a butterfly he caught. It was beautiful, black and orange and fluttered like a tiny pulsing heart in his hand. Then suddenly he torn off its wings with his fingertips and laughed when I started to cry. You got the mute girl tutoring you? Asked Red loudly as he pulled up to the curb. I knew he wanted me to hear. JT shrugged. She's pretty and good at math. What else do I need? He opened the door and got out. Red sped off almost hitting one of the colored women who worked in the cafeteria and was trying to cross the street. He leaned on the horn and she hurried out of his way. I wanted to say something to her as she walked toward the side of the school. Are you all right? Isn't he a jerk? Or maybe even just hello? But before I could get up the nerve, she was inside the building and the moment was gone. Hi, Marley. JT sat down next to me on the picnic bench. I smiled at him. So I guess, so said JT. So I guess I'd have to say something. In my excitement over planning the JT and Marley love story, I'd forgotten that tutoring him would involve actually speaking. You ready, he asked. I opened my math book and my homework fell out. The first bell rang. Great. We only had five minutes to get to class. There were 21 problems we'd never finish in time. But JT's grin was as wide as ever. You're a sweetheart. Before I could swoon over his words of endearment, JT picked up my homework and put it in his book. He winked and slammed the book shut. Thanks, Marley. See you same place tomorrow, okay? He strode off waiting for an answer. All yesterday, I'd imagine the scene. JT and I would have so much fun working together. He'd say he wanted to spend more time with me. We'd do fractions at the Double Scoop Ice Cream Parlor and Long Division at Crystal Burger. I wanted to believe the best of him. Maybe he'd had another flat tire. Maybe his alarm clock hadn't gone off. Even though the truth was staring me in the face, I couldn't help thinking that maybe tomorrow he'd be on time. Chapter six, a new part. I spent all of homework frantically doing my homework, my math homework again. When I was done, Liz leaned over and whispered, what are you going to do for your history report? For a minute, I didn't know what she was talking about. Then I remembered the project Miss Taylor had told us about yesterday. The one that involved an oral presentation. No wonder I'd done my best to block it out. Liz kept talking because I had this really good idea and I wanted to ask you to work with me. I glanced at Sally. Liz saw who I was looking at and her face dropped, but she pasted a smile back on so fast. If I blinked, I'd have missed her true reaction. Oh, of course, she said brightly. That makes sense. You and Sally being old friends and all. I suddenly knew she'd imagined the scene just like I had pictured the one with JT. And this wasn't the way hers had ended either. I felt bad, but not bad enough to actually work with her. Liz turned away, but as she did, she knocked her math notebook to the floor. I bent over to pick it up. On the back was a square with a lot of squares in it. And some of the squares were numbers. I knew what it was. It was a magic square. Magic squares have been around for just about forever, according to David's old math book. He used to let me read it when he wasn't studying. The Chinese discovered them way back before Jesus was even born. The simplest was a three by three square and the numbers one to nine arranged so that every row, column, and diagonal added up to 15. Liz had a four by four square on her notebook with some of the numbers missing. I ran my fingers over the numbers. The top row added up to 34. It's a magic square, said Liz, sounding a little embarrassed. It's a silly game my mother taught me. 
13, I said, pointing to a blank spare. square. Oh, said Liz. Thanks. I couldn't figure that one out. I stared at the square again. Yep, each row, column, and diagonal added up to 34. It was beautiful. I handed it back. I handed back the notebook and counted two, three, five, seven. What was your idea? Well, I have this book about the founding of the Little Rock and the Indians who used to live here. And Liz paused and looked at me. Then she shook her head. It's okay, Marley. You don't have to pretend to be interested. It's just, I took a deep breath. Why me? Liz shrugged. You seem like a hard worker. At my old school, I was the one who always ended up doing all the work. I knew what that was like. I worked with Sally on every project since third grade. Maybe it was time for a change. Okay, I said. Really? She asked. I nodded. Great. Meet you at the public library tomorrow after school. I nodded again. The bell rang and homeroom was over. Liz gave me a little wave and walked off. What was she? A root beer, an extra thick, thick milkshake with two straws, carrot juice. I don't know. And I don't really care. I just wanted to know everything she knew about magic squares. On Friday, I arrived early and waited by the kick picnic table. And again, JT arrived just before the bell rang. He winked at me as he took my homework. Like your hair. Judy and I stayed up late the night before putting my hair into curlers. I knew I should feel mad about the homework, but I couldn't help being just a little tickled he had noticed. And at least this time, I'd known to do the homework twice. When I walked into the library that afternoon, there was Liz, her hair pulled back in a ponytail, reading glasses balanced on her nose. When she saw me, she pulled off the glasses and waved. Hi, Marley, she said with a smile. I wasn't sure you'd come. I shrugged. Clearly, she didn't understand how much I liked math. When she realized I wasn't going to answer her, she handed me a book and I sat down and started reading. We read for a long time. The book she had pulled for me on the Quapaw Indians was actually pretty interesting. The Quapaws were the Indians who had lived in Little Rock when the first settlers came. The book talked all about their families and how they got married and what they did when they died. When I looked up, Liz was two pages of notes in crisp, neat handwriting. Find anything interesting, she asked. I nodded. What? I passed her a book and pointed to a paragraph about what they did with orphan children. She read it quickly. Cool. Hey, we could do this for the class. Put on sort of a pretend ceremony. Pick some kids to be the orphans and some others to be the fathers. That would be interesting and more fun than just reading a boring old paper. Only one problem, she said. I looked at her. You have to talk, she said. I mean, during the presentation. I shook my head. I did not talk in front of the class. That was like asking me to walk down the street in my underwear. You have to at least say something. I just looked at her. If I do all the talking, people will think I did all the work, and that's not fair. She was right. It wasn't fair, and I didn't care. I didn't give oral presentations. It's important to face your fears, said Liz. It makes you a better person. I thought I was pretty good just the way I was. We stared at each other for a long moment. It was If it was a staring contest she wanted, I knew I'd win. Sure enough, she looked away first. I'll tell you what, said Liz. My mother has a whole book about magic squares. You speak during our presentation, and I'll give it to you. Just when I thought I'd gotten the best of her, she went and turned it all around. A book of magic squares? There's no way I could resist that. And from the smug look on her face, I was pretty sure she understood how much I liked math after all. Fine, I said. Liz smiled at me. The front door of the library opened and a couple of colored girls walk in. Liz stiffened. I knew Negroes were allowed to use this library now. The rule had passed a few years ago, but I didn't see them there much. It was like the bus. Officially, anyone could sit anywhere they wanted now, but most of the time, the colored folks stayed in the back. I think we're done enough for one day, said Liz, closing her book. 
She glanced over at the colored girls again. They were waiting, trying unsuccessfully to get the librarian's attention. I wondered if Liz was like some of the other kids at school calling colored folks names I wasn't allowed to say. I wondered if I could do this project with her if she was. There aren't hurting anyone, I said quietly. I know, she said, I'm just tired of studying. But I didn't quite believe her. <laughs>